crazy. Everybody was stamping on everybody. Today in Cincinnati, stunned city officials are trying to learn what went wrong last night outside a rock concert by a British group called The Who. It was billed as one of the biggest concerts to hit Cincinnati. But what happened outside The Who's show on the night of December 3rd, 1979, has gone down as one of the most tragic events in rock history. This morning, at least eight people are dead in Houston during an incident at Travis Scott's Astro World Festival. Now, according to authorities, the incident was triggered sometime after 9 p.m. Everybody from the back started trying to push to the front. Like you were like this close to the person in front of you, like wherever your body was at, that's how you had to stay. People were just like laid over the person that they were with, like with their mouth open. You saw people like covered in vomit. What started as a fun night of live music quickly turned death in Rochester, New York. Unfounded fears of gunfire touched off a stampede during a rap concert at Rochester's Main Street Armory last night. All across the country, people roll out in droves to support their favorite musical artists, visiting huge music festivals like Coachella, South by Southwest, the former Warp Tour, Austin City Limits, and Afropunk, just to name a few. Most of the shows I just mentioned have one thing in common, huge crowds of fans ready to spend the entire day listening to some of the biggest artists in the game across all genres. Now, when it comes to events this huge, the right precautions aren't always taken to ensure the safety of its patrons, as seen in 2021, when 10 people were crushed while attending Travis Scott's Astroworld Festival. Now, Travis Scott wouldn't be the first to find himself in a situation just like this. Many artists before endured the same. Artists like The Who, Guns N' Roses, ACDC have all had the same thing happen. But while there are terrible tragedies like this occurring all over the world for decades, there's one particular event that is mostly remembered by those that it affected personally. And to see where it took place, you'd have to go no further than Harlem, New York, because it was here in December of 1991, where one event that people thought was meant to raise money for charity would result in tragedy, and the families of nine innocent people would find themselves seeking justice and answers. Do you blame the crowd itself at all? I don't really, I can only go by what I saw on television. I just felt that if the doors were open, that the children would have been able to go inside. On today's episode of Evil Intentions, this is the story of the City College Stampede. imaginable thousands of excited teenagers and other young people crushed into a suffocating heap at the bottom of a staircase at city college leaving nine dead and almost the city college of new york is located at 160 coven avenue in the harlem section of new york city founded in 1847 the city college of new york has a long 175 year history a college that many from around the country attend with hopes of building a bright future the area that surrounds City College, the Greater Harlem area. Streets filled with history. Going back as far as the 60s, huge events were often held. During the springs and summers in Harlem, basketball games, block parties, street festivals, and charity concerts were frequent. There was always something going on. One event was meant to take place on December 28th of 1991 at New York City College. The Christmas holiday had just passed and the people of New York were gearing up for a cold New Year's Eve where celebrations are had in every corner of the city. But celebrations would be the last thing on the minds of those in attendance on December 28th. The event in question was a celebrity basketball game, at first said to be an AIDS fundraiser, hosted and promoted by Sean Puffy Combs. He held the event along with another well-known rapper, Heavy D. Combs was no stranger to throwing big parties and even bigger after parties. It was something he did often, and this event, like many others, was supposed to go down as a memorable night full of notable moments. As the event approached, tickets were sold at $20 a ticket to ensure entrance to the star-studded event. Some of the well-known names in attendance were LL Cool J, Mike Tyson, Dougie Fresh, and Red Alert. The teams facing off against one another were full of talent. The game was marketed as the Hepsters vs. the Puck Daddy All-Stars. Some of the talent on Heavy D's team included Michael Bivens of Belle Biv DeVoe and New Edition, members of Boys to Men, Run DMC, Fife Dog, and Big Daddy Kane. They'd go head to head against Puffy's team, which had members of Jodeci, Brand Nubian, Guy, Nice and Smooth, and Ed Lover. 
DJing the event was Funkmaster Flex of Hot 97. On Christmas Eve of 1991, a then assistant for Puffy walked into the office of Charles Sutton, the then president of the Apollo Theater, to request that tickets be sold at the Apollo Theater box office on 125th Street, the heart of Harlem. But according to reports, none were available since the request was declined. One reason given for the decline was that the Apollo couldn't accommodate every request coming their way. Another reason was that 98.7 KISS FM looked to also be involved in the event, with their name being on the flyer. And their main competition was WBLS FM, who was owned by Apollo's parent company, Inner City Broadcasting. The Apollo was already listed on the flyer as a point of purchase, and KISS FM had already began promoting the event since December 20th. And in those ads, they'd mentioned the Apollo as a location to buy tickets. Phone calls poured into the Apollo, but those people were turned away. Flyers were put onto the window of the Apollo directing people to Boss Emporium, a Harlem clothing store, an alternate location to purchase tickets. The then owner of Boss Emporium stated that she wasn't sure how many tickets had been sold, but she knew they were going fast, mostly thanks to the popularity of Heavy D, who was signed to Uptown Records. KISS FM promoted the event every chance they could, and even gave away 10 pairs for free. The confusion about ticket sales is where the problem began, but this didn't really alarm anybody. This was a charity event after all, so nobody was exactly eager to cancel it. Not until it was too late. The exact location of the event was said to be at the Nat Home and Gymnasium, located inside City College. It was then that a member of KISS FM staff saw the insanely large crowd standing outside of the college, knowing that there was just no way everyone could possibly be let in. In the hour that followed, a call was made to the KISS FM station, letting them know that the event was over-publicized. Wendy Williams, who was a KISS FM DJ at the time, would tell listeners that if they didn't already have a ticket to the event, they should stay home. But it was just far too late to put that message out there. The numbers continued to grow. Hundreds were gathered on two separate lines at first. According to some witnesses who attended, the crowd was already huge by 5 p.m. There were no police on college grounds as of yet, just a few men telling people to step back, although officers mentioned that they were there by 4.45. Timelines often conflict when it comes to this. Time continued to pass as celebrities were starting to arrive, entering through the same entrance that ticket holders were meant to enter through. Many were led into the gym, but outside, the crowd was growing restless. It was said that guards were letting people enter who didn't have tickets, allowing them to purchase tickets on the line. Obviously, this made actual ticket holders very upset. Many continued to try and force their way in. A crowd already filled the staircase that leads into the gym. These were many, some ticket holders and some who purchased their ticket on the line. They'd form on the stairs, pressed up against the gym doors. Doors that if you were standing in front of them, would require you to pull them open, not push them. If the crowd would grow too large, there'd be no space to open those doors and get inside. The gym itself already had a large amount of people who'd been let in. Some who were inside looked on as they waited for their friends or loved ones to also be let in. The idea of seeing so many huge names in music at the time, for a mere 20 bucks, was just too good to pass up for some. But around 6.30 p.m. that evening, tragic events truly began to unfold. It was said that Greg Nice of Nice and Smooth and a few others showed up to the event, approaching the glass doors leading into the building. As they made their way in, the huge crowd who'd been outside waiting would begin to surge in behind the entourage. Some stated people determined to enter were saying one, two, three push, and they were starting to move inward. The safety glass on the doors would shatter under the weight of hundreds pushing. Some who were entering through the broken entryway would pull the dangling shards of glass away in order to let more people enter. People were beginning to panic and cry out for others to stop forcing their way in, but those cries were ignored. The huge crowd that just broke through the glass was now pushing on all of the people below in the 12 foot wide stairwell, crushing everyone who stood against the doors. According to early reports, Greg Nice tried his best to get the crowd to move backward by standing on someone's shoulders and yelling at the crowd to move back, but to no avail. Others saw it differently, however, with later reports mentioning it looked to be more of an opportunity to escape the mayhem by stepping on others. Only those who were there that night know for sure. I'm just mentioning what I've come across over the years. But either way, full-blown panic and chaos would erupt as many climbed onto each other, trying to fight their way out. 
Others gasp for air as hundreds of bodies pressed onto them, making it impossible for their lungs to expand. Many lay unconscious as others fell on top of them, and bodies stacked onto one another. They were all trapped, crushing one another, and the situation would only get much worse. Eventually, some of the doors were opened, and those inside who become privy to the ongoing chaos just feet away began pulling people inside the gym where there was room, and the pandemonium continued. The following footage was taken that night and shows the confusion, chaos, and attempt to save lives. The crowd will look on in disbelief as many injured collapsed into the gym. Bodies were carried throughout the gym, appearing to be lifeless. On the mic, rapper Dougie Fresh would make a plea for those with a cellular phone to call for help, since the only pay phone was behind a locked door. Calls were made from within the gym walls, and the situation was already as bad as it could get. A, a female? Yeah, a female. A female? Yeah. Is he had an asthma attack? Uh-huh. According to then police commissioner, two calls came into 911 at 7.14 p.m. One was about the crushing, and the other was about shots being fired outside of the gym. But that call was discounted one minute later. Ambulances headed to the gym were canceled. Might be due to the fact that those reports of gunfire were then said to be false. But the panic about a now possible shooting would send the crowd inside the gym into a frenzy because the rumors of a shooting quickly made their way around the gym, causing a stampede of people to run for safety, some taking cover under the bleachers. The first ambulance to actually arrive at City College arrived at 7.28 p.m., about 15 minutes after the chaos was already well underway, since timestamps on footage show attempts to save lives at 7.13 p.m. Many who weren't even EMS workers would try their best to revive others who'd suffered critically in the crushing just moments ago. Some suffered from seizures due to the asphyxiation, and attempts were made to perform CPR and chest compressions. Some described hearing people take their last breath as their bodies became lifeless. They tried their best, but there was nothing that they could do. A total of nine people between the ages of 15 to 28 years old would tragically lose their lives that night. Nine people who haven't been forgotten. Leonard Nelson Jr. was a 17-year-old from the Bronx. He lived in the Chester houses with his parents. He was an only child and always pleasant to those he came across. A trait neighbor said was thanks to his parents, good people who raised him well. He could be seen walking around the neighborhood with his Walkman in his hand, with hip-hop blaring from the headphones. He was mostly inside and didn't do much hanging outside in the streets. Leonard was a high school student and a quarterback of his football team, the Truman Mustangs. He was full of energy and he loved sports. He had plans of going to college and begin building his future. A football field in Co-op City would later be named after him in his memory. Leticia Krishan Hurd was 19 years old and also from the Bronx. She had plans of attending John Jay College and becoming a probation officer with the idea of helping those who might be caught up in the system. Her heart was always in a good place. She had her eyes set on her goals, planning on living in her own apartment soon. And as the event approached, she was very excited at the idea of seeing so many famous faces battle it out on the court. Her brother had warned her that she should skip this event altogether, only because at some hip hop events, incidents were known to take place in the crowd. This is something we've heard a lot about in the past, even depicted on the screen numerous times. Of course, let's not ignore the fact that this isn't something only seen in hip hop so the music shouldn't take all the blame. Letitia was looking forward to it though. She trusted that the event would go smoothly and she was ready to have a good time. Her mind was made up. The Heard family would be among the last to discover the fate of their beloved Letitia. They thought she went to spend the night at her boyfriend's house after the event, but a friend who was supposed to meet her at the event would later identify Letitia as one of the victims. The word of her death was spread quickly through the streets. Her brother only found out about his sister's death when someone came up to him offering condolences. He had no idea that she was one of the people who had lost their lives the night before. This was his first time learning about it. Sharice Ann Noel was 26 years old from Brooklyn, New York. She came from an avid church-going family. 
She lived with her grandparents and her six-year-old daughter. After working hard in school, she had recently become a nurse, receiving her nursing degree just a week before this event took place. Her entire family attended the graduation, and the vibe was nothing but proud celebration. She was happy about having achieved this. She attended City College that night with her boyfriend, but when the chaos unfolded, they'd become separated. He looked for her as best as he could as the situation only got worse, according to her aunt. Her boyfriend was shown pictures later to help identify her, and the truth set in that Charisse was one of those who died. At her funeral, fellow nurses filled the rows wearing their work uniforms to honor her memory. Jabal Rainey was 15 years old, the youngest of those who died. He was from Harlem River Drive. At the time, he was a high school student. He was raised by loving parents who tried their best to keep him away from the dangers of the streets. According to reports, he didn't even want to really go to the event, but decided that he would go anyway. Darren Brown was 28 years old. He was friends with the guys in Nice and Smooth and member of their road crew. He was a huge music lover, helping with concert logistics and driving them to different cities. They were childhood friends. He should have been guaranteed entry. He was a big guy, standing at 6 foot 4 and over 260 pounds. Darren was said to be a man who showed immense love to his 21-month-old daughter. He had absolutely no problem showering her with gifts during the holiday season. Sadly, the child's mother passed away delivering their daughter. But the love Darren showed his little girl was immeasurable. He was still grieving the loss of his child's mother, but had every intention of being the best father she could ever need. He also had a son, though the child's mother would find out she was pregnant a week after Darren's untimely death. Darren should still be here today, but the crushing that night was so powerful, it would take just moments before even a man of his size would become unconscious and suffer this fate. He was barely recognizable when he was identified, just days before this event, Darren's daughter, who normally had become used to calling Darren by his street name, Spice, had finally called him Daddy. That happened on Christmas. Family would be forced to tell the young child that both of her parents had gone to heaven. Darren was set to be buried next to the child's mother. Yul Dargan was 24 years old. According to his parents, he was a music, television, and sports lover. His three rheumatic apartment at his parents' home in the Bronx could be found adorned with posters of everyone from Whitney Houston to Michael Jordan because he was a huge basketball fan. He loved all sports. He was always going to the Meadowlands for events. That's why he wanted to go to this. He was known to be very active at the Walker Memorial Baptist Church in the Bronx. In fact, he was one of the most active younger people there. He was baptized there and later became a junior deacon. He was also a Bible study leader. He graduated from Cardinal Hayes High School and landed a job at a brokerage house. He had plans on moving to Atlanta sometime soon, where he had relatives. He intended to work within their transit system while attending college. The day of this event, Yul rode the D-train toward Coney Island with his mother. It was her birthday. He gave her a bottle of White Diamonds perfume as a gift and let her know that he'd be giving her her birthday card after the basketball game later on. She was a nurse at Coney Island Hospital. He made almost the entire trip with her before turning back. That night, Yule's mother watched the 11 o'clock news and saw the reports of a horrific event that had unfolded at City College. She would ask herself, didn't Yule say he was going to City College? Moments later, her phone started to ring. It was her pastor letting her know that Yule had been injured. She would later find out that he was dead. Over 600 people would attend Yule's funeral with celebrities like Mike Tyson and Don King attending. Many wore purple, Yule's favorite color. He was buried in a purple blazer that he had recently worn to church. Before he left that train earlier, Yule's mother would tell Yule to enjoy himself at the event later on, and he responded with, I know I will. Those were his last words to her. Dawn McCain was 20 years old from the bed section of Brooklyn, New York. She was described as kind as someone who shared a very close relationship with her family. She loved her nephew, often taking him to events like basketball games. This night, he had a cold, so she left him home so he could feel better. The year previous to the tragedy, Dawn spent her time placing tickets on windshields of illegally parked cars as part of her job as a city traffic agent. During the holidays, she felt guilty about ticketing cars sitting outside of churches and supermarkets. So rather than ticket them, she would just ticket somewhere else. She was the last to succumb to her injuries, dying days later after being put on a ventilator. Sonia Williams was 20 years old. Sonia grew up in New Rochelle, but was residing in the Williamsbridge section of the Bronx. She was a nursing student. Sonia went to this event mostly because it was billed as a charity event for AIDS, not for the celebrities or the basketball game. 
She was friends with a girl said to be dating Puffy at the time, and she was given tickets. This should have secured her entry. She was known to be a great student, quiet and very smart, and described by her brother as stern. She was in her third year at Lehman College on her way to becoming a pediatric nurse. When Sonia was younger, she had attended a concert at City College where she saw a new addition perform. Her mother took her. The event went without a hitch. So when Sonia expressed interest in going to this, that was their recollection of what type of setting this would be like. Unfortunately, this was an entirely different type of situation. Dirk Swain was 20 years old from the Bronx. Dirk was a junior at Hampton University in Virginia. Dirk had dreams of becoming an architect, a passion that came about when he was a child, when he started watching the Brady Bunch on television. Dirk had just escaped the near-fatal situation only three months prior, when he was struck in the head by a stray bullet after a football game that turned violent. He was told to stay away from large crowds and was normally home, but Dirk wanted to get out this night. He worked at a movie theater not far from home and called in sick this night to attend the game, not knowing that this night would soon turn into horror. Just days before this event, on Christmas, Dirk told his brother Jason that he was grateful at another chance at life, having been shot and made it out alive. Friends who saw him at the concert stated that when he passed away, his eyes were wide open. He might have had a seizure. His brother Jason would go on to make a documentary in memory of the nine victims, titled No Way Out, the 1991 City College of New York Stampede. I highly recommend watching it to get a different angle of these events from the people who were there themselves and who were heavily affected by this. The link will be left in the description of this video. The events that took place at City College on December 28th of 1991 leave horrifying memories in the minds of those who lived through it and in the minds of those who lost someone or knew someone there. While it may not be spoken about as frequently as other events, to the people of New York, every year as the holiday season approaches, nine different families have to face another year without their loved ones, and countless others have endured lifelong trauma after witnessing all this tragedy unfold. Of course, the question becomes, who's to blame? Why did this happen? There was a celebrity game that took place mere weeks before this. What was the difference? Selling too many tickets? Was it the miscommunication about tickets sold? A college campus that didn't take proper precaution or do their research before allowing an event like this to take place? Was it because of the big support behind a cause later found to be bogus? Was it the crowd who didn't realize the real danger that they were in? Was it greed? It would be safe to assume that nobody involved in this event wanted this outcome. It was done with good intentions according to everyone. But sometimes, things unfold quickly right before your eyes. And before you know it, the situation can no longer be contained. And when it gets to that point, everyone involved in something like this, from the venue to the promoters to the officers, have to be on the same page. Because tragedy can strike faster than you expect. It's always important to point out that many are to blame. But what these families wanted more than anything was to have their loved ones back. They want to be able to speak about that night and how it should have went, free of tragedy and with proper security, smiling faces among one another. And this night was the exact opposite of that. And now... These families are left to pick up the pieces. May all that lost their lives that night rest in peace. My deepest condolences go out to all the families affected in this tragedy.